Welcome to the CanMed Coffee Talk podcast, where we talk with the leading minds in cannabis science, medicine, cultivation, and safety testing. I am your host, Ben Amaralt. I'm the marketing manager at Medicinal Genomics and proud member of the team that puts on the CanMed conference. Happy New Year. I hope you had a safe and happy holiday season, and I hope you were able to have some time off, maybe get recharged and you're ready to take on 2023. I know that our team is excited for this year. As I record this, we are just over five months away from the CanMed 23 Innovation and Investment Summit. It's an invitation-only three-day event that will feature intensive industry workshops and more than 30 presenters covering the latest innovations in cannabis science, medicine, cultivation, and safety testing. It all takes place at the Marriott Marco Island Beach Resort in Florida, May 15th through 17th. That's a new venue for us, and with it comes a lot of outstanding amenities, including three miles of white sand beach, world-class spa and golf, and much more. Head over to CanMedEvents.com now to learn more about CanMed23 and request your invitation. And while you're there, be sure to also sign up for email alerts. We will be sharing the first round of CanMed 23 oral presenters very shortly, as well as some additional information about our industry workshops. So stay tuned. My guest today is Dr. Addy Ray. Addy is a neuroscientist known for her extensive expertise on cannabis. She is an assistant scientist at Legacy Research Institute an adjunct faculty at Washington State University. Her human and preclinical research is focused on pain management, addiction, and harm reduction. Addie has published in top top academic journals under the surname Wilson Poe, and she is passionate about the interaction between cannabis and opioids. Our conversation focused on a paper Addie recently co-authored called The Nose Knows, Aroma But Not THC Mediates Subjective Effects of Smoked and Vaporized Cannabis Flower. As the title suggests, the study found that users' subjective enjoyment of a cannabis flower's aroma was correlated with that flower producing a pleasant effect for the user. Or more simply put, if you like the smell, or more simply put, if you like the way a cannabis flower smells, you're going to like the way it makes you feel. During our conversation, we discussed the the subjectivity of cannabis aroma, whether the ability to predict a positive experience through aroma is learned or intuitive, how closed container markets do a disservice to consumers, how the study found that the amount of THC in a cultivar did not correlate with positive user experience and what that means for the industry, the difference between feeling high and feeling good, and the importance of tolerance breaks. Before we get to my conversation with Dr. Addy Ray, I want to thank this episode's sponsor, Advanced Nutrients. Founded in 1999, Advanced Nutrients was the first to develop a complete nutrient system that unlocks the true genetic potential of the cannabis plant. Since its inception, the brand has introduced more than 50 innovations to the cultivation community and continues to revolutionize the space through proprietary scientific discoveries. Learn more at advancednutrients.com. Good afternoon, Adi. Thanks so much for joining us on the podcast. It's a pleasure to be here, Ben. Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, I mean, I'm really excited to talk with you today about a paper that you co-authored called The Nose Knows, Aroma But Not THC Mediates the Subjective Effects of Smoked and Vaporized Cannabis Flower. It's a fascinating paper to me because it really challenges this idea that THC potency determines cannabis flower quality. Um, it's something that's come up many times on this podcast, so I'm happy to see some, some data confirming this. 
Um, there's a lot of great information in the paper. I marked up my copy quite a bit and I'm providing a, a link to the paper in the show description so the listeners can read it as well. But before we get too deep into it, I wanted to ask you, why did you and your co-authors decide to take on this study and what questions were you looking to answer? That's a that's an excellent question. And I guess what we should really highlight is that the study, the paper, is actually a byproduct of the actual purpose for the work. Because the purpose for the work was uh, a couple of weed cups. It was, you know, cannabis competitions. And the purpose there, of course, was to identify objectively the best cannabis in Oregon. So truly using the most rigorous scientific tools we could to really identify high quality cannabis and then reward those cultivators for producing that cannabis. So that was the original intent behind all of the work. As a result of doing those cannabis competitions here in Oregon, um, we were able to, you know, come up with this big anonymous database, which then we could, you know, mine post hoc for all of the insights that you see in the paper. Um, so it was really important for my teammates and I, um, and, and I'll highlight them specifically, Steph Barnhart and uh, Jeremy Plum. Uh, among many others. Um, it really was a community effort to use the best tools possible to define quality cannabis. Excellent. So now you said this, you collected this data over, over several years or several events. How did your criteria for determining quality cannabis change as you, as you did this? You know, it's funny, it didn't change a whole lot. So in 2017 was the first time that we really sat down to think about what are the components that we are trying to analyze here, right? What questions are we going to ask of our volunteers who are sampling the cannabis? And, you know, it, it's kind of no brainer stuff. It's really, you know, like, how much did you enjoy this? We always knew that aroma was important. So we asked how pleasant was the aroma? And then we also ask questions about the sort of large domains that cannabis is well known for, right? Like, is it energizing or sleepy? Does it make you feel relaxed or tense? You know, really, you know, not rocket science. <laughs> it's really all the things that all of the reasons that consumers are using cannabis to begin with. Um, that's what we were looking at. Um, so that, that's the human sort of data collection end of things. And then on the other end too, you know, we wanted as much information about the plant as we could, you know, at that time. So we had the widest panel of analytes in terms of um, cannabinoids and terpenes. Um, and, you know, of course, our understanding of this plant and the aromatic molecules um, that contribute to its aroma have evolved a lot since we last collected data um, in, you know, 2019, 2020. Um, but nevertheless, it was really important for us to have high fidelity human information and high fidelity plant information and see just literally it's a fishing expedition. What is the data going to tell us? Mm. So it's really liberating in the sense that, you know, most of my academic research is of course, hypothesis oriented. Um, so it was really liberating to have a true expedition and, and tell a data driven story, allow the data to tell us what's important about cannabis. Yeah, no. And it sounds like, so you're collecting two different types of data, as you mentioned, you know, on the human side, what was your experience with this? And then, you know, on the lab side, you know, what are the, the percentages and the numbers here? So, so I imagine you tried to marry the two um, to try to find some patterns and that, and that's sort of what you're doing in the paper here. Yes, exactly. And what you don't see in the paper are all of the results that are not so exciting. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, one of the things, of course, we are super interested in is, you know, what is this entourage effect? You know, right. what evidence do we have that a combination of molecules is somehow contributing to some domain of the human experience? And despite our best efforts to put it through machine learning models and, you know, apply all of these like really rigorous um, techniques to the data, it spat out a couple of things, um, one of which was THCA is important. Well, yeah, we, we, we kind of <laughs> already knew that. So, <laughs> right. so you know, um, we didn't find, you know, any one terpene, for example, that was, you know, 
strongly associated with any one particular domain of the of the human experience. Um, so, you know, despite our best efforts to look for those things and prove or disprove those sort of urban legends that are floating around out there, you know, mere scene being um, sedative, for example, our data didn't support that. Sure. Um, so, so yeah, we, we, we weren't able to really hone in on any one particular molecule as being the driving factor in the cannabis experience, other than knowing that, you know, THCA, the, the you know, decarboxylated version or the carboxyl um, of THC, um, we, knew, we already knew that was important. That's what contributes to the psychoactive properties. Right. No, and it's interesting that you mentioned terpenes because, you know, we, we talk about terpenes a lot and how they're important and how they, you know, differentiate the cannabis cultivars. But really, I mean, you're not the first person that I've talked to that said that, you know, they looked for a connection between terpenes and experience or even, you know, therapeutic applications but they're not really finding it. Um, you know, why do you think that is? Or do you think that, you know, terpenes are a bit of a, a red herring here? What's, what's going on? Yeah, I think that the most likely what's going on, and I, you know, of course, this is just one of many possibilities, but what's likely going on is that things are a lot more complicated than we would like them to be. So we're looking for the easy answers and um, it's probably not an easy answer. One of the cool opportunities that I had in sort of digging through the literature to prepare this manuscript was getting really, really deep into the sensory sciences and, and you know, even like looking really deep into uh, fine fragrances, perfumes, consumer fragrances, that kind of stuff. And that body of literature is, you know, very mature and there's lots of cool artificial intelligence models for aroma, you know, predictions and stuff like that. Um, but what I came to understand, and there is a citation in the paper, was that the presence of even a single additional aromatic molecule totally changes our perception of an aroma. And if that's true for just your olfactory epithelium that inside your nose, what else is happening higher up? all the way up in your brain and especially, you know, in the really sophisticated circuits in our prefrontal cortex. So if we know that, you know, the presence of even one other molecule can totally change our experience of a product, then that's probably what's going on. It's probably just such a complicated and um, a situation that's so difficult to replicate time after time that there's, you know, we're, we're really at the limits of our technology, right? We, we simply don't have the tools to process all of the information better than our brains already do, which is to say, this smells good. Right. Right. And that was, I mean, I mean, we've kind of been beating around the bush here, but that was sort of the main finding of your paper, right? Is that, you know, what smells good to the user is usually predictive of what is going to create a good experience for them. Exactly. And that subjective component, I think, is really important to highlight. You know, we do show okay. some data in the paper where there is, if we look at the variability in people's um, responses or, you know, their ratings for the pleasantness of the aroma. Um, so there are some flowers where they have a high you know, score. They're really great smelling flowers. And those great smelling flowers, there's a lot of consensus. People agree. There's low variability in terms of the aroma score. But the further you get away from like the, you know, top 20% of great smelling flowers, the more polarizing they are. Mm. So, you know, on the far end where we have some flowers with low aroma scores, there's a huge degree of variability. Some people love them and some people don't. And so the analogy that I think about all the time, again, coming back to perfume, because I think it's the, the most apt um, comparison, is that, you know, we can all agree that this super expensive, you know, like designer perfume at this specialty perfume house, we can all agree, oh my God, this thing smells amazing. It's like, you know, ambrosia. Um, whereas if we're walking through the mall and there's someone's, you know, spraying something cheap into the air, that one might be a little more polarizing, right? Mm. There might be some of us that would be like, oh yeah, I'd wear that. And others would be like, no, 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 don't 
don't get near me, right? So I think that's a really nice comparison um, because it tells us that it really is subjective, that um, there's some degree of consensus. If you have a really great smelling flower, you know, the breeder or the wholesaler or a bud tender might be able to say, okay, these three are the best smelling ones. Um, but there is absolutely um, a subjective component where a consumer must be able to make a decision for themselves based on their own sensory perception of that flower. Right. And now I'm curious too, um, and we could talk a bit about, you know, how, what the profile of the different users are, whether they're daily users and things. I know there's a lot of information about that, but do you think that what's going on is that people are smelling something familiar, you know, it might be similar to a strain that they've used in the past and they're associating that with a positive experience, or is it just truly, um, you know, intuitive where like, Oh, I like this smell. And, you know, it just so happens that that's what their body wants. Yeah. I, my hypothesis and, you know, I'm a neuroscientist and my, my field is definitely not the sensory sciences. So maybe someone with that kind of training would give you a more intelligent answer, but <laughs> my hypothesis is the latter that it's just intuitive, right? Mm. Like when you're walking down the street, that reaction you have when you smell the, you know, falafel cart on the sidewalk, right? Yeah. That reaction that you have is not something that you're like, Oh, that reminds me of that one time that I was in New York city, you know, for New Year's Eve, whatever, you know, like it's an intuitive, like, it, it, it's, it strums the instrument within your heart, you know, like <laughs> you don't have to think about it. There's a reaction there. Um, and sometimes it's like, Ugh, you know, like gross or sometimes it's really appealing. So I think that aroma is really interesting because all of the olfactory processes and the evolution of um, being able to smell things in the environment, interpret those environmental cues as either, a cue to approach or avoid something that's really, really deeply buried in our medulla. And, you know, that's really old circuitry that is conserved across, you know, the phylogenetic tree. So my sense is that there is like low level, you know, intuitive or, or, you know, sort of automatic kind of processing that happens with aroma that we don't necessarily need to put much conscious thought into. Interesting. So if instead of looking at, you know, THC percentages or terpene percentages, when we're evaluating which cannabis to buy, we should really be getting our nose in there and giving it a smell. Absolutely. That is, I think, the biggest take home message for all of the regulators in states where there are closed container laws. So in Oregon, you know, I'm here in Portland and we have the benefit of having, you know, deli style um um, dispensaries. So you can literally walk into any store and stick your nose in an ounce. It's great. Um, mm. But that benefit doesn't occur in California and in Washington. Um, and it's really in those closed container markets where the regulators have done a serious disservice to the consumers because they have robbed them of the only information that we have to make a really great decision about what to buy. Yeah. And now is that in place for, you know, sanitary reasons or is that the thinking? I don't really know. You know, I think it's probably if I look at the most likely answer is probably just a law enforcement one. Right. It's just a matter of keeping things tightly under control. Um, yeah. It's, you know, I, I wasn't there when they made those regs in Washington, so I can't say what those motivations were. Um, but I can say that, you know, it's it's not you know, those sort of package only markets are problematic, not only from the perspective of, you know, being devoid of aroma, but it's excessive packaging also, which is like, I'm sure an entirely different podcast, but, but yeah, it's <laughs> unnecessary. Yeah. And so going back to this whole idea of, you know, sort of the, the quantitative results that we often see on packaging or on websites um, is not as informative as, as just smelling. Um, one of the, some of the results from your paper were showing that, you know, THC potency was not correlated with subjective appeal. And, you know, the, the amount of terpenes present wasn't either. I was wondering if you could talk a bit more about that. 
Oh, I would be so delighted to, Ben. It's my favorite topic in the whole wide world. <laughs> All right, let's do it. Um, so right now, and there are very good reasons for this. Right now, THC is the primary marker of quality cannabis, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, this has roots both in the legacy market, you know, in the prohibition days, um, there are, you know, sort of black market drug dynamics that contribute to why people who produce drugs want to make them as strong as they can. So there's that legacy that has carried over into this regulated environment. And in this regulated environment, there has been a push toward more and more potent products, right? Demand for high THC products has been high. So then, you know, the supply chain responds by producing high THC products. And so you have this feed forward cycle where everyone is producing where what they think the customer what they think the customer wants and the customer thinks they want THC when in fact our paper demonstrates that, you know, the amount of THC is really irrelevant. I, I'm not at all, you know, our data doesn't support and, and I don't think that THC is irrelevant. You know, it's very obvious that there is a relationship between THC and psychoactive effects. That's what gets you high. However, there is not a linear relationship between how much THC and um, how much enjoyment there is. So, so that brings up another topic, which is this distinction between getting high and feeling good. Because, you know, there is a therapeutic window. There's a sweet spot where you do need THC to feel something. But if you have too much THC, the negative effects outweigh the beneficial effects. So, you know, that there is an assumption that more THC is better, more THC is high quality, more THC is a better value. Um, and there's this, you know, like ever escalating push toward more and more THC, um, which is not an evidence-based approach because this, this data tells us that, yeah, THC is going to get you high, but it's not necessarily going to make you feel good. Right. No, and I, I, I always think it's interesting that, you know, this push for more and more potent cannabis, more higher percentages of THC. Um, I mean, and if you look at alcohol, I mean, that's just, it's not the case. You know, people aren't going to the li liquor store and buying Everclear or just drinking straight ethanol. Like, it's, it's more of an experience about the flavor and, you know, everything else that comes with it. Um, it's just interesting that cannabis hasn't gotten there yet. Exactly. And, and I like the, the fact that you use the word yet, because I think that we have an opportunity right. here, right? This is a wake up call that it's time to diversify the, spent, the dispensary shelf. You know, like right now, the way that the retail marketplace looks, it looks very much like going into a bar that has 37 flavors of Everclear. Right. right. Uh, and so if we think about, well, what what does what does the consumer actually want versus what do they think they want? So what they actually want is probably diversity. They want to try a bunch of different stuff because there are a bunch of different kinds of experiences that are possible with cannabis. It's really interesting that, you know, alcohol, it really is a great um, comparison because we have a, a pretty um, narrow band of responses to alcohol. Everyone knows what it feels like if you're over 21. Everyone knows what it feels like to have one drink or have a little buzz or to be drunk or to be too drunk, right? Like those are all very, uh, there's a lot of consensus around what those things feel like. But with cannabis, it's far less clear that what I'm experiencing is what you're experiencing. And, you know, it's very common that you might be at a party or something and people are passing a J around and some people are talkative and fine and keep taking toke after toke and others are very quiet and sitting on the couch by themselves. Right. So we know that even even the literal same joint has different effects in different people. So, you know, I, I think that this this paper really demonstrates that we owe it to our consumers to give them choices. Right. We mm -hmm. want them to have 
IPAs and, you know, right. naturally, naturally fermented skin contact white wines. And, you know, we also need commodities like Anheuser-Busch, you know, whatever, you know, they're, they're, we just need to have a range of choices um, and that those choices a consumer should be able to choose on the basis of aroma. Absolutely. Yo, and you brought up a great point when you were talking about how, you know, the same joint can have different effects on different people. And it, it, it made me curious too, going back to your results here and people who were rating cannabis for the pleasurable effects, were those pleasurable effects actually subjective too? Meaning did people, were they looking for an energetic high versus a sleepy high? Like, was there differences there too, that you sort of had to layer in? Yeah, that's a great question. So the the anchoring question that we used for our volunteers was, what do you consider a good cannabis experience, right? And so we gave them a range of answers from, I don't want to feel anything at all. I want to feel totally normal to, I want to be so high that it's almost uncomfortable. So they have, you know, some choices in between there. And regardless of, you know, their age or um, how frequently they consume cannabis, the vast majority of people reported that they wanted a prominent shift from their normal state of consciousness. So regardless of people's tolerance or, or you know, the products they prefer or their experience with cannabis or, or any other factors, most people are looking to feel quite a bit different than their normal daily life. Um, so, so that's, that's the way that we sort of typified, you know, what, what the, yeah, what the volunteers look like. And another thing that, that stood out to me when I was reading the paper was that smaller amounts of cannabis consumed actually had better subjective appeal. Yeah. And I think the, the answer to this, it probably has something to do with the fact that people self titrate how much cannabis they use. Mm. So Carrie Cutler at Washington State University um, is a wonderful colleague of mine. She's shown this very elegantly um, by having people smoke and take dabs over um, Zoom calls. And um, she shows that, you know, um, People who are using higher, more more potent products, they tend to take fewer puffs and hold it in less amount of time. So there seems to be, you know, this effect where people, especially because, you know, this is a double blind evaluation. So people don't know the, the strength of the, of the products they're trying. And so um, probably what's happening is that, you know, they'll pack a small bowl or, you know, light the end of a joint and take one puff and kind of see where they are. Mm. And then they stop because they're happy where they are. So it may be, you know, an artifact in the data that, you know, the vast majority of people just smoked very small amounts of cannabis. And of course, you know, wherever the data is stacked, that's where you're going to find all of those results. Uh, Okay. That makes sense. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, uh, another thing here, the less frequent cannabis users reported better subject, subjective, uh, scores. Yes, this was really interesting. Um, and I, this is really a mystery to me. I don't, I don't have a hypothesis for why this might be, you know, in, in the process of the peer review, our referees asked us, well, is this because of tolerance? Is it because these, these folks are, you know, um, they're able to register the pleasant effects of cannabis because they're not using it as often. Um, And that could be contributing to some extent, but we also asked all of our participants to take a 48 hour tolerance break before they started their kits. Mm. Um, And we also gave them at least 30 days to complete, you know, all of the samples between eight and 10 samples. Um, And it was just, it's just, you know, we might've had a handful of judges who, you know, were already daily users or consumers and they, you know, used all of their products, you know, day, one day after the other, but, you know, most of the people in the study, like the vast majority, um, you know, was spaced them out really nicely and they adhered, you know, more than 80% of the people adhered to the tolerance break sort of guidance. So I don't necessarily think tolerance entirely explains that phenomenon. Um, I think it might, you know, if I had to like, if I'm, if you're going to put me on the spot to give you an answer, (laughs) I would say it's maybe just like, 
you know, it's the idea that it's not a party if it happens every day. It's just more special if it is, you know, not as often. Um, we, our brains habituate to our environments and our, you know, um, our situations. And it just might not feel as special or fun or cool if it happens more frequently. Yeah. No, and I think that the whole idea of tolerance, too, it's a bit of a double-edged sword where if, you, if you're taking breaks, you might be more sensitive to the positive aspects of cannabis, but you're also more sensitive to the negative aspects, too, with the paranoia, anxiety, or anything like that. Bingo, exactly. And this is actually something that we actively work with with our chronic pain patients. So in my other studies, you know, we work with, um, you know, people who are starting to use cannabis to manage their orthopedic pain. And it's a process of developing enough tolerance to reap the medical benefits of cannabis. Because of course, you know, initially for, for some of our folks, and this, these are also, you know, a lot of older folks with orthopedic, you know, um, issues, arthritis and, you know, hip replacements and things. And, um, you know, growing up in the Nixon era of prohibition, I, I, you know, it's no wonder that they're hesitant, you know, and, and a little bit afraid to even start. So, um, but we, we specifically go through a sort of ramp up the start low, go slow kind of mentality um, is the best way to get our patients up to a level of, you know, THC consumption that, sufficiently eliminates their pain, but they've built up enough of a sort of psychological tolerance to it that they're in a comfortable headspace. Mm. Yeah. And it, it, it's funny you bring that up. I've, I've been looking through some videos from our past, past CAMED conference, getting ready for, for the one that's coming up. And I was looking at a presentation from Dr. Dustin Sulak mm -hmm. uh, that was part of our medical practicum. And, and he was talking about this you know, that therapeutic window and, you know, you need to get up to a point where you're feeling the effects, um, but you don't want to necessarily exceed that either, or else, you know, you can kind of get to a point of diminishing returns and then you have to actually, you know, take a step back or lower the dose, which is sort of counterintuitive. Um, so it's sort of interesting how you need to really find that sweet spot. Absolutely. You know, Dustin and I are very close colleagues. We see, you know, eye to eye on this issue. And that idea of the therapeutic window for our patients is not exclusive to our patients, you know, but for, for the adult use market, I tend to refer to it as the sweet spot, right? you got to stay in your sweet spot. And if your tolerance has gotten so high that you can't get up into the sweet spot anymore, then it's time for a tolerance break. And our brains are remarkably responsive to tolerance breaks, you know, like, um, that I haven't seen quite enough literature to satisfy me on, on all of my hypotheses around tolerance, but, um, but from all of the, you know, the limited literature there is and all of the heaps of anecdotal data that are out there, taking a tolerance break really works. Excellent. All right, AD, um, before I let you go, I wanted to give you a chance to, um, plug any other resources related to this that you think that our listeners would like to read up more about or any of your own social media or websites or anything like that, please let me know and I'll, I'll put it in the show notes. Sure. Um, I think if folks have questions for me or want to, you know, learn more, they can always reach me on Instagram. I'm at Dr. Period 80, B-D-I-E, um, D-R period A-D-I-E. Um, so that's, that's probably the, the, easiest way to get a hold of me or to, to find out, you know, what other work I'm, I'm producing. Um, and uh, let's see, I would say that in general, other things that I, you know, think might be timely to highlight are just the fact that, um, you know, right now we're speaking in mid-December and there is a ton of outdoor flower that's curing. And um, that's going to hit the dispensary shelves, you know, probably early January and outdoor flower in particular, because the outdoor environment is so, you know, diverse and unpredictable. That means the chemistry in those outdoor flowers tends to be more diverse also. So um, if you're a cannabis consumer and you're listening to this, I would encourage you to, you know, ask your bud tender which smell the best and which ones were grown outside and just especially support your regenerative farms. Excellent. Excellent. Well, Adi, thank you again for joining me. This was a great, great conversation. And uh, I hope we get to do it again soon. 
Yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity, Ben. It was a pleasure. Hope you enjoyed my conversation with Dr. A.D. Ray. Check out the links in the show description to learn more about the topics we discussed. And thanks again to this episode's sponsor, Advanced Nutrients. Our next episode drops January 18th. That's two weeks from today. In the meantime, please do check out the new and improved CanMedEvents.com. The team really did an exceptional job updating the website with all the information about our CanMed 23 event. And of course, you can still find videos of all the previous CanMed presentations and panels in the CanMed archive. You can also find all the previous episodes of the podcast as well. And while you're there, make sure you sign up for email alerts to get all the notifications around this innovative industry-leading event. I also invite you to engage with us on all our social media platforms. We're on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Just search for CanMed Events. And lastly, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. Doing so really helps us improve our rankings and reach more listeners. All right, that's it from us. Stay safe, stay healthy, and be sure to join us on the next CanMed Coffee Talk.